everybody. Um, so, a couple of quick announcements as always. First, uh, there's a homework assignment due on Canvas on Wednesday, uh, so before class starts, so be sure that you submit that. Um, the, uh, the exam is going to be a week from Wednesday, which is after mid-semester break and after mid-semester grades, so your mid-semester grades are going to be based mainly off of exam one and also all of the other work that you've done uh, so far. Um, there's also, uh, if you look back um, to the very first page of the syllabus, there's a second book that I said that everybody needed to get, which is called The Fever by Sonia Shaw. It's a book about um, malaria and human evolution. Um, uh, there is, on November 8th, uh, so about uh, a little less than a month from now, there is a reading assignment and a, and a, and a homework assignment off of that book. Um, most of what you need for the homework assignment is um, off of the first three chapters. Um, and I actually happen to know somebody who's married to somebody at the publisher. So I got some. So I got permission to um, to share um, the first couple chapters um, with everybody uh, um, in the class. See those on Canvas, um, and then you can. Uh, that's most of what you need for the homework assignment. Um, the book is really <laughs> fascinating, and I strongly recommend that you read it anyway. Uh, but most of what you'll need for that homework assignment is actually available on Canvas with the assignment, which is posted. Uh, there's just like four questions or something like that. Um, so it's posted now. It's not due for a month. Um, but just so as you're looking ahead, um, we'll be talking about evolution in the next unit. Um, yeah, any questions about any of that? Yeah, sure. Is there a quiz this week or no? There's no quiz this week. Yeah, there are two quizzes per unit, um, and with the exam coming up, there's not a quiz this week. <coughs> yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, so today um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about genetics and cancer risk. Um, since, there, uh, since there were a lot of questions about that that people have had. Um, and then after that, um, we want to talk about um, protein trafficking, which is kind of like the main topic uh, that's um, scheduled for this week, uh, and, uh, uh, for the syllabus. Um, in particular, um, secreted protein. So, so, pro so sometimes cells that make proteins that they need to secrete out of the cell. Integral membrane proteins, which are um, proteins embedded in the fatty and lipid uh, area of the membrane. Um, and then uh, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus um, as two organelles that are involved in processing these. Um, well, actually, in talking about the secreted protein, we'll also sort of be talking about the, the uh, especially the, the endoplasmic reticulum, kind of introduce it a little bit um, when we, when we uh, do that. Um, but yeah, first of all, there, there, were, there were a number of questions that people had about, um, about cancer risk um, and genetics. Um, it was at the very end of class last time. I, uh, there was a, there were some questions about that. Um, so we talked last time uh, a little bit about um, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are two different genes that are involved in detecting DNA damage. Um, we've also talked about um, p53 and retinoblastoma protein RB, um, and these are. Uh, some genes that are very well known and very well associated with, um, in some cases, particular types of cancer, um, like uh, uh, cancer of the retina or breast cancer, although also with great increased risk of ovarian, prostate, and other forms of cancer with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Um, and P53, which is sort of the master regulator for, for a whole bunch of different, um, uh, when DNA damage is detected, to, uh, to, take that, um, uh, to take that information that the DNA has been damaged and convert it into an action um, uh, done by the cell, which is to um, repair the damage. Um, and there are a variety of different enzymes that detect and, um, and remove the damaged DNA and replace it with the proper DNA sequence. Um, the book goes into a lot of detail about that that you don't need to know. Um, but if you're curious about how cells go about repairing DNA damage, there's plenty in the textbook about that. Um, and then also, um, if the cell is unable to repair 
its um, uh, damaged DNA, then p53 will remain active and trigger the cell to undergo apoptosis, which is um, uh, a sort of programmed cell death, um, which again is you know maybe too bad for the cell, but from the perspective of an organism, I would much rather a few, set, a few of my cells die than a few of my cells start dividing out of control or have mutations in them that are going unchecked and, un, uh, and, 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 uh, and continuing to propagate throughout many generations of cells in my body. Um, so these are, in a certain sense, kind of like the big players. And in an introductory class like this, we, um, we talk about kind of like the big um, critical proteins that are, that are very important for, for determining uh, whether or not cells become cancerous. And in a tumor, you will often find one or more of these mutated. There are others as well. There's this enzyme RAS, which is another um, uh, uh, tumor suppressor gene that's mutated um, in, uh, in um, uh, a lot of tumors as well. Um, that the book mentions a little bit, and um, but so 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 that doesn't but that doesn't really answer fully the question about what what does it mean to be at risk for cancer, for example, um, as opposed to like so for example if you have um, if you're carrying one mutant copy of uh, retinoblastoma protein one you know, loss of function non-functional allele of retinoblastoma protein, then it's essentially a guarantee that at some point in your life, your retinas will develop tumors. Um, and, uh, and that's because as the cells are undergoing mitosis, by random chance, one of them is going to have an error that does not get detected by P53 and other machinery um, and leads to a loss of function in what was your one working copy of that gene. Um, and therefore, you um, now have no working copies and um, no regulation on uh, certain aspects of the cell cycle in the retinas. Does that all make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, so how does mutation occur without cancer So if these are checking mutations? So, um, Biology is always just sort of messy and, and error prone, uh, and I don't remember. Actually, I don't remember the, the exact statistics, um, but it's something like um, when DNA polymerase three is copying DNA, um, something like one out of ten or one uh, one out of five thousand, one out of ten thousand um, um, uh, bases that it incorporates is a mistake. And considering that you have six billion bases, that's a lot of mistakes. Um, and so there's a lot of um, um, protection to detect and prevent those mistakes from being propagated on down the generations. Uh, and so one thing is the DNA polymerase 3 itself has um, an error checking mechanism where it sort of feels behind itself and like double checks as it's, as it's going, and it will back up, cut away some nucleotides, and try again if it makes a mistake. Um, so initially, it's, it's making like 1 in 10,000 mistakes. It catches something like 98 or 95 or some, some large fraction percentage of those. So now we're into the range of, let's say, 1 in, um, one in a million bases um, that, um, that DNA polymerase 3 doesn't. But when it's done with it, it's still left a mutation there. Um, but that's still 1,000 mutations per every time you're propagating your DNA, because there's uh, or actually 6,000 because you have 6 billion bases. Um, so there's about, so, so if you have one in a million mistakes, then that's still um, 6,000 mistakes. Um, and so that's where these other enzymes that are looking for these mistakes and cutting them out and replacing them come from. Um, but because those enzymes are also imperfect, um, occasionally one mistake will slip through. And the estimates are that something like one or two, between, between a half a mistake and maybe two mistakes, every round of cell division um, uh, goes unchecked. That means sometimes, sometimes cells divide and there were no mistakes left over in the DNA. Um, there was perfect, perfect replication of everything. Um, sometimes the cell divides and there was just one mistake or maybe two mistakes that none of these other things have. And so even though P53 and all of the, and, and BRCA1 and BRCA2, which also look for different types of DNA damage, and Zermodoma pigmentosa A, which we haven't talked about, but the book talks about a little bit, um, all are looking for these different forms of DNA damage. Um, there's a small chance every round, or they, 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 they're imperfect, and, and, every, and every round of cell division, on average, they may be missed one base. And most of the time, that one base 
is in the middle of some non-coding region. Um, every once in a while, it's actually in a gene, and it creates a loss of function uh, mutation in that gene, but that loss of function mutation is tolerated because you have two copies of the gene. Sometimes it's not. Some genes, you actually need both copies to, to, to work properly um, and for your cell to, for your cell to function. There are, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, I think, when, I think next Monday, a week from today, we'll talk a little bit more about, um, uh, about um, incomplete dominance and cases where the amount of stuff matters. Um, but in any case, so yeah, so, you, so there's some mistakes to get through. This sort of the that Oh, uh, okay, so these are like the big players um, uh, that that um, uh, that um, sort of get highlighted because they have a huge role in, in cancer and a huge risk, a huge increased risk in cancer. Um, but um, but there are in fact dozens of genes um, linked to cancer. Um, and actually, as another example um, uh, of uh, of something um, somewhat related to this. Uh, or actually not, it's, it's conceptually related, but a very different idea, um, is just uh, something like, for example, eye color. So um, in eye color, there's one gene in particular that has a dominant effect on eye color, um, where if you have one, um, one of the, the sort of working functional versions of this gene, then um, the amount of melanin that gets produced in your eyes is on the high end of the spectrum, making them uh, brown or hazel or something like that. Um, and then there are, uh, there, and then if you have two recessive copies of that, then your eyes are on the lighter end of the spectrum. Um, but what determines the difference between brown and hazel, and the difference between um, uh, uh, between blue and green, um, and and so on, um, involves not just this one gene, but um, maybe as many as twenty other genes. Um, and we have identified. Um, we've identified five or six different genes that play a role. Um, but those five or six different genes we know are not the whole story. Um, and we estimate are probably only about half the story in terms of eye color and what determines how, how light or dark your eyes are. Um, another example is height, um, where uh, with height there are at least 30 genes known that correlate with how tall you are. And yet, when we look at how close identical twins are in their height, um, they're usually within like uh, a half inch or so of each other in terms of their height. Um, and the 30 known genes don't quite account for all of the um, uh, genetic uh, components that we're aware of with height. Um, and so we know that we are missing, or we know that we don't know everything about all of the genes associated with height. Um, so what that means is that you know we identify in studying cancer um, uh, in uh, you know for decades we've known about these genes that are that are sort of very critical for regulating the cell cycle and create a high risk for cancer when they're mutating. Um, but we um, but we we also know that there must be dozens of other genes that can increase your risk of cancer a little bit when they're mutated, um, but don't guarantee that you're going to get cancer. Um, there's one, uh, there's some, something called uh, ST5, um, which is redundant with another gene um, called RAB3, um, and these are both tumor suppressor genes. And so if you happen to have a mutation, um, a loss of function mutation in ST5, um, you, may, you could be born with missing one copy of ST5. And then you get to be an adult, and a million of your cells have lost the other copy of ST5, and none of them become cancerous. Um, and that's because the function that ST5 performs is, is a very sort of small piece of checking for DNA damage. Uh, it's just called suppressor of tumor five. It's not a very informative name. Um, uh, and so this um, um, this this gene's function um, is redundant with so many other genes. They're sort of all sort of taking care of and, and double checking each other's work. Um, and so if you lose one of these minor <coughs> double checkers, that's not going to guarantee that you're going to get cancer. Um, but if you have if, if you're missing a copy of that, then you're more likely to have cancer than somebody who has two working copies of it. 
It's not a guarantee. It might raise your risk of developing cancer by age 40 from 3% to 3.5% or something like that. Um, and, so, uh, and so that gene, um, that, a, a, a loss of function, a non-functional allele of that gene, is not going to guarantee you to, that you're going to get cancer. It's just going to increase your risk. Um, you could also have a mutation in some of the regulatory regions, um, like the enhancer elements that control P53 or RB or BRCA1, where your cells can still make the protein, but they make a little bit less of it than usual. And if they make a little bit less of it, then a few more errors are going to get through every round of cell cycle. Maybe instead of an average of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, nine errors every ten rounds of cell division, you have an average of 11 errors out of every 10 rounds of cell division, which isn't that much. Doesn't guarantee you're going to get cancer, but it starts meaning that your DNA is your DNA's getting mutated a little, your DNA's, uh, you're losing functions and genes a little bit more rapidly than others. Some cells are going to die because of that. Some cells are going to have no, no deficit at all because of that. And every once in a while, maybe out of every 50 people that have that sort of under-functional P53, Somebody's going, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody's going to develop a, uh, cancer who otherwise wouldn't. And so, when we look across hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, we can see that there are genetic risks associated with cancer. And if you have family members with cancer, you have an increased risk of developing it yourself because maybe some gene that we haven't even identified yet has a mutation, and that in that uh, and that mutation um, is. Most people is sort of providing a little bit of extra protection, but for you, that muta you're, you've got that mutation, so there's just a little bit less protection than everybody else has. So, yeah, does that kind of make sense? One of the um, one of the recommended readings for this class um, that I didn't require is this book called The Violinist, um, and he talks about um, Parkinson's disease at the very end, and, and he had some familiar risk for Parkinson's disease, um, and uh, and he discovered uh, he did 23andMe and discovered that he had a, a risk of Parkinson's disease as well. And at first he was kind of like freaked out about that, but then he decided then he sort of learned more, and he and he concluded by saying something like um, that that genes play in probabilities, not in certainties, um, and that's usually true. I mean, for some genes there are certainties or near certainties, like retinoblastoma. If you're missing a copy of that then the probability of developing eye cancer is like 99%. So that's pretty scary. Um, you know, if you're missing a copy of P53 from your genome, the probability of develop developing tumors before a fetus, a fetus is even born is virtually 100%. Um, and, so, um, and so, you know, um, with, but, but for most genes, we're talking about, you know, a little bit of an increase or a little bit of a decrease in this. And those genes don't get as much discussion because we don't know their function as well and like unlike P53 they're not like missing in most tumors so we really focus a lot of attention on fixing them. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, so because um, it's because it's regulating a different part of the cell cycle. So R RB is not um, involved in detecting DNA damage, so P53 doesn't kind of cover for it. RB is involved in detecting when cells are overcrowded and preventing uh, and sort of, um, so this relates actually a little bit to some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today with secreted protein. Cells release proteins as chemical signals and small molecules as chemical signals to each other. And some of those chemical signals say, hey, it's too crowded, everybody needs to stop dividing right now. And, um, and with RB, um, uh, its job is to sense when the cells are overcrowded. And so, um, and, and that naturally happens. Like some, you know, there's mitosis, then it starts getting all crowded, then everybody gets the signal, they stop, then some, some of the pigmented epithelial cells start dying off, and so now the, the density of cells is lower, and so now they stop getting that signal, and so, and so, but because it's not about DNA damage, it's about this sort of cell-cell communication in cancer, the P53 doesn't really cover it in the way that P53 can cover for example for a mutation in BRCA2 where um, there are other enzymes also looking for uh, uh, DNA damage there and coordinating P53 on that front. Does that answer that? Yeah. Other questions about that?
Um, one other thing also is there are um, so inherited risks and, and acquired risks. Um, so, for example, um, uh, if I uh, if if I I don't know get uh, it, uh, so airline pilots um, or, or, or airline uh, flight attendants um, have a bit of an increased risk of cancer because they're flying above uh, the stratosphere, getting hit by more cosmic rays and so on than people who spend more of their time on the ground. Um, and um, and so if um, if you know if I if I if I have kids and then I take a job as an airline pilot and then I get cancer because I've been hit by some cosmic rays, that doesn't affect my kids, right? It's only with the genetic material that I pass on to them. Now, if I'm up there and cosmic rays happen to hit something that's about to become a sperm cell, and then that like knocks out RB or something in that sperm cell, then that's a problem for my kids. Um, but if a cosmic ray comes along and hits some dividing uh, cell in my, uh, uh, in my liver or something like that, um, uh, while I'm flying in an airplane, um, then that's bad news for me, um, but not bad news for my kids. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. So that's that's what I wanted. To, that's sort of the, the what I want to talk about here in terms of this. So now we're gonna for the second part of today and into next time, change gears a little bit to talk about protein trafficking. Um, but before I do that, I kind of wanted to, to give a, a bit of a, an overview of kind of like where we are and where we're, uh, and sort of like how, how all this material ties together. So um, back a after the exam, we, we, um, we, talk we began talking a lot about, um, about genetics and about genes. The focus of this unit is about cancer and understanding um, inheritance by thinking about inherited risk for cancer, inherited guarantees of cancer. Um, what it means for something to be dominant um, from a cell's perspective, what it means for something to be dominant from an organism's perspective, how those are basically always the same, except um, when you have a situation where, um, uh, where um, something can be recessive for a cell and yet dominant for an organism because, um, uh, because um, of the fact that, that Lots of function mutations happen, and um, and that one cell or those couple cells that lose function in the one working copy of the recessive gene become an issue for the organism, um, and that really only comes up in cancer, where a single cell can become a problem for the organism. Um, so aside from that, though, we've talked about sort of thinking about inheritance, thinking about dominant, thinking about recessive, thinking about functional proteins. Um, as you're thinking about that, because the the uh, um, the material um, for the exams and so on in this course is cumulative, you should also be thinking back to when we were talking about biochemistry in the first unit. Um, and when we were talking about, um, for example, we had these, these sort of situations where we had um, DOPA gets converted by some enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase into dopamine. Actually, no, I gotta have that backwards. Um, uh, Tyrosine gets converted by tyrosine hydroxylase into dopamine, um, and then there's uh, uh, L-dopa uh, dehydrogenase or something that converts that into dopamine, and then some other enzyme, enzyme number three, that converts dopamine into norepinephrine, and then some other enzyme that converts norepinephrine into epinephrine. Um, and so, you know, it losing an enzyme we talked about it in unit one as if there was just one gene, or they're sort of thinking about yeast or bacteria, where there's a single gene, uh, where they're haploid, they only have a single copy of each gene. Um, now we're thinking about diploid organisms, where there's two copies of the gene that encodes enzyme three, and so you have to lose both of them before the biochemistry falls apart. Um, or I could have some, they're extremely rare, only going to happen if a cell is really not checking its DNA or some cosmic ray is super, super unlucky, um, where I could convert tyrosine hydroxylase into something that um, is some mutant version of tyrosine hydroxylase that instead of not functioning, um, instead converts tyrosine into a toxin. That would be a dominant mutation of the cellular and a dominant mutation for the organism um, and, and lead to trouble um, uh, in, in that sense. So, yeah, so, um, so we've sort of been thinking about inheritance. 
and then sort of applying that knowledge about inheritance to thinking about cancer, thinking about DNA damage. Um, you should also be remembering about DNA replication and types of mutations, the nonsense, missense, and so on for unit one. Any questions about sort of any of that link? Um, yeah, and then, uh, and then, so the other thing that comes into play um, with this, uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about um, this unit in cancer, um, is also thinking about the cell, of course, thinking about mitosis in the cell, um, and, uh, and the microtubules. So, here we've got the nucleus, here we have the centrosome, which um, Dika, the guest lecturer, talked about, and the centrosome radiates out microtubules <coughs> all around the cell, um, and the microtubules have what's called a plus end and a minus end, um, which just has to do with the arrangement of proteins, the arrangement of the individual protein monomers that make them up. It's um, the plus and minus actually isn't about electrical charge. It's um, it's just uh, we could call it the A end and the B end, or the up end and the down end, or whatever the inside in and the outside in, which maybe would have been more informative. Um, uh, but you know that's that's sort of it's, that's the nomenclature we've got. Um, it's very it's it's identical to how an individual protein has an N terminus and a C terminus, or an individual molecule of DNA and RNA has a five prime end and a three prime. End. Uh, they're just sort of two ends of the model. Um, and so we talked about before how, um, uh, it actually, Deacon mentioned as well that in DNA, prior to, to, to mitosis, the centrosome replicates. So you have two centrosomes. They go to two opposite poles, and then the chromosomes line up at the middle and get pulled to the opposite poles along the microtubules. Um, she also talked about these motor proteins, kinesin, which uses the energy of ATP to walk along the microtubule to the plus end, and it can sometimes be carrying some big old cargo, some big backpack essentially full of stuff that it's carrying along with it, um, and, um, and then um, dynein, which looks a little bit different, um, but for our purposes, we can sort of think of it as, this, as, as similar. It uses ATP to carry things um, toward the minus end of the microtubule, which means bringing things from the outside edges of the cell back in toward the central. And so um, with this sort of background understanding of that, um, <clears throat> And also thinking about the relationship that I talked about last time of integral membrane proteins embedding themselves into the extracellular matrix. Um, today we're gonna today and Wednesday we're gonna think about how proteins um, get carried around or traffic through the cell is how is what this is called. Um, and in particular, when a cell needs to release a protein as a signal, um, or when a cell. Um, uh, has um, a sensor, a, a protein that spans its membrane, um, that senses a signal. What's going on with that? So that's sort of what we're going to be thinking about. Um, or, um, in, or the integrins are another example of integral membrane proteins. Um, and the extracellular matrix is made up of secreted proteins. Okay, yeah, so questions about that. Okay, so. Um, so first of all, <coughs> in terms of, so again, we'll sort of redraw our cell over here. Here's the nucleus. Um, there's this network, this membrane enclosed network that's, that is near the center of the cell, near the nucleus. Um, called the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. And it turns out if um, 
if you want to release a protein out of the cell. So for example, um, there's a video that I posted last unit about the production of insulin. It's, um, it, was, it was posted when we were talking about transcription and translation. Um, but one of the things that it points out is that um, if we want to, is, so insulin is a small protein that needs to get outside of the cell and into the bloodstream to do its job. And so in order to get it outside of the cell and into the bloodstream to do its job, what, what cells do is they package it inside what's called a vesicle. And then the vesicle gets carried out to the surface of the cell. Um, quick question, which, mi which microtubule motor protein is going to carry vesicle out to the surface of the cell? I heard mumbles of different things. Who thinks kinesin? Who thinks diamine? Okay, most people thought kinesin. A few people were afraid to answer. Yeah, kinesin carries things from the middle out to the surface. So kinesin, so, so somehow we've got to get um, our insulin floating around inside, the, inside this vesicle. And a, and a vesicle is just a lipid bilayer. So if we zoom in on this here, remember back from unit one, we've got these phospholipids that have polar heads and um, nonpolar tails. And so these lines, this line that I'm drawing here, or this line of the ER, or this line of the vesicle, these are all lipid bilayers. They're all bubbles. Um, and so um, here we have the cytoplasm, which is a watery compartment that is sort of the bulk of the cell fluid. Here is the extracellular fluid. And then inside the ER, we've got um, what's called the lumen of the ER. Right there. Up there a little bit. Um, so that's the inside there. <coughs> Same thing for the vesicle, the fluid inside. So we've got this fatty bubble. Um, that is, so the, this line is a lipid bilayer, and there's fluid in water in here, water out here, water out here, and our goal is to get the insulin into the extracellular fluid out of here. <clears throat> okay, and so what, we're, what the cell does is it puts, we're gonna, uh, the, the final step before the insulin gets released is that the insulin is in a vesicle um, going toward the membrane, being carried by a kinesin that I'm not drawing here because the picture is getting a little crowded. Uh, and then when the vesicle gets right up to the membrane, there are a bunch of other proteins that get involved. And what's going to happen is the vesicle fuses with the membrane. Um, and, so, uh, and so what that means then is that the lipid bilayer of the membrane becomes continuous with the lipid bilayer of the vesicle, and the fluid of the lumen becomes continuous with the extracellular fluid, and so then our insulin protein just diffuses out of the vesicle and diffuses out into the extracellular fluid. So, um, yeah, so questions about that? Yeah, sure. So, so all the phospholipids in the, in the vesicle, they just sort of, they, they go up the wall, they kind of just like fuse into the cell wall and push that cell out? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so they, they sort of, yeah, they fuse, and so, um, yeah, and so the, um, uh, and I'll, I'll post some videos out, or I'll post links to some videos after class to sort of show this a little bit, um, where the, the vesicle becomes continuous with the, 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 the um, solution here. Um, but. Um, so this is, this is a little bit of a weird process in a sense. Um, so we could imagine, <coughs> call this, so, so some imaginary <laughs> insulin here. We could imagine insulin floating free in the cytoplasm. 
Um, and so uh, a question for right now is why might it help the cell <coughs> to put um, the secreted protein insulin, as our example, into the lumen of a vesicle um, rather than just keeping it in the cytoplasm. So why do, why do cells put the secreted proteins into vesicles? Um, in order to answer this, you're going to have to sort of think about the lipid bilayer. Think about the fact that insulin is a protein that, it, that, wants, to, that wants to exist in a, um, in a fluid-filled environment. And so it's going to be covered on the surface by hydrophilic amino acids. There might be a few hydrophobic ones tucked deep in, um, but it's pretty well covered with hydrophilic amino acids. Um, and so, and we want to get the insulin, the goal is to get insulin out of here. And so why is putting it in the vesicle a useful step along the way to getting it outside the cell into the extracellular fluid and the blood? Um, we're going to get it. So let's take about six minutes or so to discuss that with the group. I'll walk around and, um, and, and, uh, and, and answer questions as they come up. Um, and then we'll get to that.
surrounded by hydro so <laughs> It wants, it wants to be with water loving molecules. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I think uh, most of the groups have finished up, or I uh, nearly finished up with this. So um, yeah, so so what I've drawn up here is I um, actually drew, drew what I use what I drew up there is just a single line. I sort of tried to draw the lipid bilayer, the heads and the tails of all of the possible lipids for this sphere that's containing our insulin, and then the lipid bilayer for the cell membrane. With this, um, and so again, over here, this is like all fat, um, uh, the, 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 the lipid part. Um, and then we've got also this imaginary insulin molecule over here. So this is a very busy image, um, but, uh, but <coughs> hopefully we'll sort of help with the discussion a little bit um, about why pack, why the insulin needs to get packaged into the lumen of a vesicle before we can get out of the cell. Um, so, yeah, so who wants to share what their groups came up with in terms of why, why it's not so useful to have this sort of, like, this imaginary insulin that I've drawn like this, why it's really hard to get that out of the cell? Um, yeah, sure. Um, because the, if the insulin is going to travel <coughs> in the cytoplasm more than the actual fluid that flows in the water, right. it's not going to be able to make yeah, um, or another way to think of that is the water holds on to it really tightly and won't let it into the hydrophobic, but this is, yeah, I mean, those are different <coughs> explanations. Um, <coughs> yeah, so, um, right, so, so this insulin is a hydrophilic, it's a pretty small protein with a lot of hydrophilic amino acids on it, and if we had it floating around the cytoplasm, there would be a huge barrier, literally and energetically, um, for the insulin to get across the fat and into the extracellular fluid. Um, and actually, if you go back and look in um, one of the first couple chapters about in the book, the book about the chapter about lipids, I think it's chapter four or five, um, they um, spend a lot of time discussing the permeability of lipid bilayers. We didn't spend a ton of time discussing that um, here, but, um, uh, but essentially, if something is hydrophobic, if you have like cholesterol or um, uh, um, testosterone uh, or cortisol, um, a, a hydrophobic signal, that can just diffuse right across the lipid bilayer because it, it has no trouble traveling through the fat. Um, but this insulin molecule that I've drawn here where it would never be found in the cytoplasm can't get across the membrane. Um, so crossing the membrane isn't really um, feasible for this insulin. Um, Instead, what we're going to do is make, is sort of squeeze these together so that what's going to happen is essentially we end up with this sort of erase a few and sort of draw what it looks like at a later intermediate um, where um, <coughs> the, the, the membrane kind of gets stretched out a little bit in this process, um, but what's going to happen is so on all the tails hanging off of these here, and then um, the tails hanging off of this. And so what's going to happen here is now we've got this, this watery channel, and eventually it's going to expand out, and, and the whole vesicle kind of flattens out um, and just becomes a part of the membrane. Um, so now what was the lumen of the vesicle now is the extracellular fluid, or gets diffused into the extracellular fluid. Um, 
And so, uh, and so it's just a matter of, in this case, what happens is the insulin actually doesn't cross um, a lipid bilayer. It's already embedded in fluid, and the fluid that it's floating around in just becomes part of the extracellular fluid. And by becoming part of the extracellular fluid, the insulin now is freely released and is able to float free into the extracellular space. Um, yeah, sure. So if that's supposed to keep uh, merging with the cell membrane, and like what is it, like, kept on adding more and more lipids in, like how, how does the cell membrane cell <coughs> Yeah, great question. So, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different factors into that. Um, one is that sometimes cells want to get bigger. Um, so, uh, let me hold on to that thought for just a second. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. There was another question. Something had same same question. Something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so back over here to our endoplasmic particulate. Um, uh, what we're so actually so. In, so what I said is, is kind of a nice little explanation. Like once the insulin is in the lumen, we can get it to the extracellular fluid without having to shove it over a lipid bilayer, push it through a lipid bilayer that is more passive. Um, but that sort of creates a new problem, which is how did it get into that in the first place? Um, that's what we're going to start with next time. Um, but the short sort of version is that part of the part of the endoplasmic reticulum is covered with ribosomes. And these ribosomes are essentially squirting proteins um, into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then from the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, um, they can butt off in vesicles and get off to the surface and get released without ever, without ever having to get those proteins to cross a lipid bilayer, except during the process of being squirted through. Um, and so we call this part the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it's covered in ribosomes. There's a whole other part of the endoplasmic reticulum called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is sort of the answer to the questions you were just asking, asking or at least part of it. Um, and the job of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is primarily to make membrane, but also to metabolize fat. Um, and in some cases, build fat, in some cases, to metabolize away fat. But a lot of fat metabolism, whether it's building or breaking it down, happens over here in the smooth part of the endoplasmic reticulum. And the job of the smooth, and, and, so, and so what's going to happen is, yeah, so as, as vesicles are fusing, we're getting a little bit more surface area to the cell. But if that, um, uh, but, then, but then the cell, if it doesn't want to grow bigger, then it will pinch off, squeeze in some membrane, sort of suck in a little membrane like this, and turn it into a new vesicle. We call that an endosome, when it sucks in a new... Um, a new bit of membrane, um, and that endosome, then that's a way to sort of remove membrane from the surface. And then that endosome might get transported back to the smooth ER where it's going to get metabolized away and we can be digest that, or it might get taken somewhere else and brought in, brought in somewhere else to get, to get, uh, to get used in another function of cell. Um, and so um, it, it, tracking lipids can get quite complicated and involved. Um, for, for this, for, for Wednesday, we're going to focus in on tracking the proteins as they go through this process, um, and then kind of relate that back to integrins and fibronectin and extracellular matrix and so on from, um, from uh, as we think about cancer and as we think about how cells embed in other in, in, in the uh, anyway, I will see you all on Wednesday. Uh, please turn in your group assignments on your way out and make sure you complete the homework that is due on Wednesday as well.